Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Burlington Matters. I'm your host, Marianne Mead Ward, Mayor of the City of Burlington, and we have once again assembled an outstanding panel to talk about issues that we know are on your mind and, and answer your questions and spend an enjoyable half hour together. Uh, today, we are talking about mental health in our community and things that you can do about it as well. Uh, an exciting project coming up, which we're going to talk about. And here with me to talk about those things, uh, I am pleased to be joined by Eric Vandewal, who is the president and CEO of Joseph Brandt Hospital, and Dr. C Stephen Selchin, who is the chief of psychiatry as well as the deputy chief of staff at the hospital and looks after mental health and addictions. So without further ado, I'm going to come to you first, uh, Dr. Selchin, to tell us about what, uh, what you've got going on at the hospital and the new project that is coming. Uh, great, and thanks so much for having us. Um, look, mental health and addictions, um, I think, is a, an essential uh, issue for all of us. I think that uh, we're getting more and more comfortable as a society talking about our mental health and addiction needs. Um, I, I think, um, you know, for uh, for a long time, I think people were uh, were concerned to talk about mental health, um, but now I think, especially uh, especially over the pandemic, um, I think uh, I think really people um, have increasingly um, uh, started to pay attention um, uh, to this topic um, in in, uh, in public forums and uh, and really focusing in. So really uh, applaud you focusing on this um, uh, on this show. Um, our focus uh, within Joseph Brand Hospital is to meet the needs of our community. We want a, a community that feels well supported from a mental health uh, and addiction services perspective. Um, we want to support people in uh, in doing well and in in thriving. Um, and so that's what we've been um, that's what we've been focusing on um, over the years. Um, and uh, you know, increasingly important, I think, um, uh, during uh, during COVID. So we are. Um, a full service uh, mental health and addictions um, uh, community-based department. Um, and so we provide uh, a spectrum um, and continuum of care, um, inpatient and outpatient. Um, and we uh, partner very uh, extensively uh, with the other mental health and addiction uh, providers um, uh, within Burlington. Um, it's been, uh, uh, you know, over the last half a dozen years or so, I think, um, uh, we've really uh, grown into uh, a mental health and addictions innovation hub. Um, so really excited about the work uh, that happens um, in Burlington um, to really start to address crucial issues about how best to provide timely access to quality care. I think we've made leaps and bounds um, uh, in that and really appreciative of our interdisciplinary and multi-agency partners uh, on that. Um, and uh, as uh, we'll talk about today, um, it's really important um, that uh, uh, that our service um, uh, expands um, and is uh, and is redeveloped um, our infrastructure. Um, from a mental health and addictions perspective within the organization is uh, is outdated um, and our community deserves uh, that expansion so really excited about that moving forward. And that sets up my next question perfectly. And this is coming to you, Eric, about the project that's coming. And, and uh, Dr. Selgin, you said, uh, you know, timely access to quality care. That That is what it's all about. And without the appropriate services in place, it's uh, certainly uh, difficult to get timely care. And, and so you're doing something about that. So uh, Eric, talk to us about the, uh, the project and the, the request that you've got in. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mayor Mead Ward, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today to speak about such an important subject for our community. So at Joseph Brand Hospital, we have um, a, a, an inpatient and outpatient mental health and addictions program. Uh, Dr. Selchin will talk more about some of the specifics, but what we're really uh, advancing now is a redevelopment and expansion of that program. Uh, we have occupancy rates in our inpatient unit of up to upwards to 140% occupancy. So that means that we're putting more than one person in an available room at a time, which is not best practice. Um, uh, it would be best practice to have uh, people having an individual room with individual bathroom and showering facilities and, and really a healing and dignified environment. So this project aims to one, address the antiquated infrastructure. Uh, the, the current unit is 1960s vintage. 
not dissimilar to the rest of the hospital, but prior to redevelopment. And secondly, um, to expand to meet the growing needs. So th these occupancy rates we've had here at the hospital have existed prior to the pandemic. And as we know, the pandemic has really uh, amplified the need for mental health and addiction services and from an acute perspective and also in an outpatient perspective. So currently we have 19 beds uh, in the program and the project that we have uh, in front of government right now is to expand the program by 17 beds up to 36. That would include four child and adolescent uh, beds as well and uh, give us the capacity to meet the needs of our community in that healthy, uh, health, healthy healing environment and dignified environment. So important, and we'll come back to uh, some of the specifics uh, of, of how people can get involved in that provincial ask as well. Uh, Stephen, I wanna come back to you and, and talk about the impact of the pandemic. You've both touched on it. Uh, we know that mental health and addictions were serious issues uh, before, but in the pandemic, we've heard so much about really a parallel pandemic that that happened uh, at the same time as COVID and saw a worsening of mental health and addiction. So what can you tell us about that and what you are seeing in terms of what the needs are? Yeah, yeah. For, for many people, the pandemic has intensified the uh, challenge. So uh, in a lot of ways, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, the the same themes. It's not that there's one theme, uh, you know, one particular challenge, um, you know, that's been brought about by the pandemic. So, um, but we're seeing so much more of it. So we're seeing uh, more people presenting with depression, with anxiety, um, with stress, uh, with substance use. Uh, we're seeing worsening of chronic illness like schizophrenia, um, like bipolar disorder. Um, so, you know, the, the kinds of things that, that we would traditionally see, um, we're seeing a, an intensification of it and we're seeing an increase in the complexity and we're seeing an increase in the urgency. So we've had um, a two and a half fold uh, increase in the uh, in the amount of outpatient referral volumes um, uh, during the pandemic, like that's astronomical, right? You know, mm -hmm. two and a half times, um, and the uh, and the uh, that increase is actually even more substantial um, in our kids, in our child, children, our youth, our adolescents. Um, you know, that number has uh, ha has gone through the roof too, and we're seeing a big shift in terms of the urgency of it, right? We often get, um, you know, historically in an outpatient setting, we would get outpatient referrals where people need care, but the, you know, the, uh, but it's not necessarily what we would classify as, as urgent. Um, that's actually gone up, the urgency has gone up tenfold uh, during the pandemic. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, and you can imagine the various challenges um, that uh, uh, that folks have uh, have faced, um, and also you know various points in the pandemic, uh, people being uh, you know um, uh, confined together and uh, you know can't leave uh, the home, etc. It's increased tension in relationships um, and and, uh, and family dynamics and uh, and 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 the like. So um, it's been uh, you know many ways has skyrocketed in terms of what the need is. Um, I'm so proud of uh, our team at Joseph Brown Hospital and, uh, and the partners that we've been able to continue to respond um, to that need. Actually, we've seen a lot of innovation during the pandemic in order to try to keep up with those volumes. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a dramatic shift um, and, uh, and one that I think we'll be focusing on for quite some time ahead. Yeah, I just want to uh, pick up on that and and we can imagine that you know and as you've eloquently said during the pandemic the the uncertainty do I still have a job where do I go to work my school shut down I can't see my friends I'm isolated the tension in the home uh, that you touched on and now that we're out of the pandemic uh, more or less I mean not the health piece is still there but the restrictions are gone what are you seeing? I mean, that it might be natural to assume and probably incorrectly that all that mental health stuff goes away or calms down because those those trigger points, if you will, that were so acute during the pandemic are not there. So, uh, but on the other hand, you know, people, and, and I, I can certainly say from conversations I've had with friends and, and family members that, you know, for a lot of us, we just kind of held our breath for two years and you don't think about those things. And, and actually, 
your mental health uh, can take a hit after you're out of the most acute phase. And, and so I'm just interested to, um, to know what you're seeing is, is, are things slowing down now that the restrictions and those things that cause the most anxiety and stress for people are gone or, or is it the opposite? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a great question and it's such a complicated issue. I think, um, you know, I think one thing is clear is this isn't an on and off switch. It's not, uh, mm -hmm. you know, restrictions come in and, uh, you know, and, and everyone's mental health worsens and then restrictions go away and all of a sudden everything's, uh, you know, everything's back to normal. So first of all, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that are, are, are struggling with the stress and the anxiety of all of the uncertainty mm -hmm. now as, as restrictions um, uh, have eased. You know, what does this actually mean um, in my workplace scenario? What does this mean, um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting together um, with people? Uh, you know, a lot of people have different perspectives um, uh, and comfort levels around this. And actually, uh, in a lot of ways, some of those differences have have added a lot of tension in relationships uh, as well. Sure. Um, and we can't erase the last uh, a couple of years. I mean, we have, uh, you know, we have a generation of kids that, uh, um, you know, that have, you know, gone through uh, two years of very different schooling than what they're used to, very different social interactions than what they're used to. Um, you know, my, my son, who's, um, uh, who's 10 now, uh, <laughs> has been on, uh, we signed him up before the pandemic uh, to play baseball in the summer. And we didn't even realize it was rolling over year after year. So he got the notification that, you know, baseball is, <laughs> is starting up um, and it's a team. And does he still want to play? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I hope. <laughs> he, he, he's playing, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a team of kids that haven't played uh, organized sports in the same way in, in a few years. So it, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, there, there's so much there, um, right? And you know, and in all seriousness, you know, we, you know, we think about um, you know high school kids that have missed um, you know a, a two years of normative um, uh, processes and and you know the developmental impact um, of that. And so there's there's a lot that um, we're going to be adjusting to um, as a society um, again for for years to come. Again, I think the good news is. Uh, I think we're all a little more willing to talk about it than we were before, um, and, and that I think provides some hope. That's really important. Yeah, I, uh, you know, my my daughter just graduated university, and because of you know starting in the fall, uh, almost all of it except for about a year and a half was online. You yeah. know, I, I can't. I think back to my university days and. Wow, uh, having to do that all remotely, not being able to be with your friends, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, but that was what was normal uh, for, for them. For them, that was their experience. It's not normal. It's their experience. Uh, but it's very different than what uh, what people experienced pre-pandemic. Uh, coming back to you, Eric, uh, can you walk us through what the specific ask is of the province and um, and how people can can help in that, knowing that we have a pro provincial election underway as we speak. Uh, certainly uh, city council unanimously passed a resolution to support this expansion and the funding request, and we're happy to stand with you. Uh, but talk us through some of the details and what people can do to help. Yes, thank you. So uh, over the past six months, we've really uh, uh, created, trying to create a heightened awareness and understanding of the needs in the community. and so. Uh, we really appreciate council's support of the project. Um, many others have rallied uh, about around supporting the project. That includes uh, local groups like Rotary, uh, Halton Region, uh, System Leadership Group. Um, the list goes on, and there's so much uh, passion and commitment to seeing this project move forward. So to answer the question first, how can people help? Have a conversation about the importance of mental health and addiction services in our community. Uh, everybody is experiencing some form of mental health uh, challenges, be that directly or in their household. And so creating the conversation, building that awareness really helps us get the message to Queen's Park how important this project is. So in terms of the project, the specifics I mentioned, um, we are going to increase the number of beds from uh, 19 to a total of 36. In that, we, are, we will include six uh, intensive care unit beds, which are really important to transition from the emergency department onto the inpatient unit. We'll also include four child adolescent beds, which we currently don't have a dedicated capacity for dealing with our child and youth issues. And so with the program and the team we have now, 
we are able to care for kids and youth uh, in our community uh, versus them having to transfer out to other organizations, be that uh, in Hamilton or in, in Halton Healthcare. So keeping care as close to home as possible is really important, least disruptive for the child or, or youth member, and least disruptive for the family in terms of supporting that individual. So that's kind of the scope of the, the inpatient side. The outpatient side, equally important, um, a lot of the work we do is to keep people healthy, independent, and thriving in their home environments. And so that is through our outpatient programs. And so that really needs to grow and expand as well. So the project involves bringing both of these uh, inpatient and outpatient together in a renovated space on the third floor of the North Tower. So they will be co-located. Right now they're separated in, in our organization and doesn't really facilitate warm transitions from the inpatient unit to the outpatient unit. So in both cases, we're going to grow and expand. We're increasing capacity, we're getting dedicated capacity for child and youth and expanding our outpatient programs. So all of that, uh, the cost of the project with uh, some recent escalation, um, given the premiums in the construction industry, which we know are quite significant, uh, the project's estimated in total is about $44 million. Uh, the local share that the hospital would raise within the community is $15 million. And we know there's a lot of support for this project in the community. We're very confident that we can meet our local share requirements. We're working actively with the Ministry of Health right now to uh, move the project through the planning process. So our hope is to see ourselves starting the construction in, in three years or less, sooner the better. Uh, we're really putting a lot of emphasis on moving this project forward. And the one missing piece right now is government approval. And uh, we need provincial government approval of the balance of the funds, not only the capital funds, but also the operating funds. So that's a great opportunity for us today to share this with all of the viewers about the importance of this project. And I'm sure everybody listening will know that uh, they even either have an experience in their own family, extended family, or they know somebody who has, uh, has challenges and needs support. So I'd like to thank everybody in advance for rallying around this cause and, uh, and, and bringing that voice to Queen's Park and your local MPP. Well, and they're out, uh, all the candidates are out knocking on doors. I've had uh, at least three come to my door. And so it's an opportunity for everyone to ask, among other issues, uh, what their position is on approving this project. So critically important. Now, now is the time uh, to be expressing that support uh, and everyone can, can do that. Uh, that. That's great to see. Um, Stephen, coming back to you uh, around the, uh, the piece, the new piece around children and youth and uh, the fact that, that we need those resources dedicated for young, young people. And, you know, I was thinking about, uh, as you were talking, that uh, you need sort of that reactive care when someone's in an acute crisis, but we also want to focus on preventive preventive care and, and get in front of and give people the resources to deal with these things. And it really does start uh, with children and with youth. And, you know, that may be uh, startling for some people, how young uh, some of these mental health challenges can present. And, and so what can you tell our viewers around perhaps things to watch for or what resources might be available to them to, uh, to identify and address and, and really be proactive and early in in uh, meeting those mental health challenges yeah yeah early is is so crucial um and uh and that's really you know the 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 focus of everything that that we try to do is how can we intervene as early as possible um, and really help people get on um you know get on the best trajectory uh, that they that they can in life and that's where the full continuum um, becomes um, becomes so important to do that. So to your point, not many people might realize that actually the the, the majority, the vast majority of mental health or addictions concerns um, begin in the in the child and youth adolescent uh, age range. Um, you know, this wasn't this wasn't always historically um, uh, the case, at least to our understanding. If if you go back in the literature, uh, many decades, um, you know, we used to think that. Uh, the first uh, first episode of depression, for example, um, would would start on average in in people's forties. Um, but uh, um, either we weren't the, the mid my, midlife crisis, the Indeed. typical midlife crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, either we weren't uh, either we weren't catching it properly, or there's been a shift. But uh, you know the reality is, 
from uh, consistently for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, that number is in the low teens, uh, 12, uh, 13. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's true of, uh, of really all mental health and addiction concerns. So it's so important to, um, uh, to intervene early. It's one of the reasons why we try to uh, also partner closely um, with the schools um, and with uh, the, the mental health and uh, agencies that are um, directed to, to child and youth and adolescent, in particular, the lead agency, uh, ROC, the Reach Out Center for Kids, who have um, been a, a great partner uh, with us uh, over the years. Um, so, you know, uh, at the same time also, you know, uh, as, uh, as those of us with, uh, with kids know, you know, not every um, uh, bad day or upset uh, moment uh, means a mental health uh, concern um, per se. And so sometimes people can get, you know, can be unsure about is this something to intervene on or not? Um, you know, I think when in doubt, conversations with the family doctor or the pediatrician, whoever's providing the primary care can be a great place to start. Um, what you're really looking for is, um, you know, uh, changes in, in function. Um, so not just, you know, is, is, my, is my kid distressed, um, but am I seeing a, a, a significant in, uh, change in their function, in their activities at school, at home, um, et cetera. That, that is the part that signifies um, that, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, just a, a, a passing difficulty, et cetera. Um, so keeping an eye out for this, open to conversations, right? It doesn't mean that we have to, uh, you know, try to pry things um, out of our kids as, uh, as all parents will know, um, that uh, doesn't always go so well, but having- uh... yeah, Does it work? <laughs> <laughs> as a mother of three, I can tell you, it doesn't exactly. work. <laughs> exactly. Um, but having an openness to discussion um, and uh, keeping an eye on, on, uh, on uh, changes in function and having a good uh, open and ongoing dialogue with the primary care provider. Um, all of those are key. Um, we've been doing a lot um, uh, uh, to improve our child and adolescent uh, uh, and youth uh, programming. Uh, we've uh, recently recruited um, a, uh, a new uh, psychiatric lead uh, for our program um, from uh, SickKids in Toronto um, uh, and uh, been really good uh, to have her uh, join uh, our program and she's building um, a, a great team um, and, uh, and working in an inter interdisciplinary way with, uh, with our nursing and social work within the organization as well as uh, again with our partners. So we're building uh, the programming um, and we, again, we just need approval of this, uh, of this expansion to be able to really flesh out the continuum uh, for, uh, for our kids. That's great. Uh, and coming back to you, uh, Eric, you mentioned the local share and the requirement to raise the $15 million. Has that uh, local share fundraising campaign uh, kicked off and, and how might people be able to participate in that? Uh, great question, uh, Mary Ward. Uh, we're currently in the feasibility study stage. So this is a time uh, in preparing to launch the campaign. And I know our foundation is working hard and, and speaking with people in the community and donors in the community about their interest and support. And, and so far we're getting uh, in spades back saying lots of support for this project. And so uh, I expect the campaign will launch uh, likely a softer launch uh, over the, uh, the fall. And then we will see a more active campaign as we move into the next year. And we're very confident that we have our community support to raise this local share. That's terrific. So uh, watch, watch for, for ways to donate in, in the fall. <laughs> well, and if, you're, if, if people are inspired now to donate, uh, I know that uh, the foundation would welcome donations now specifically for this project. Uh, this project is going to go ahead. It's an urgent need. And uh, we are going to ensure here at Joseph Brandt Hospital that the needs get met and this project goes forward. That's terrific. So uh, you don't need to wait for approval to do the fundraising. And, and I guess, in fact, probably having some money uh, from the community is a way to help get that approval, possibly. Yes, absolutely. If uh, the more money we have in hand on our local share, that also signifies to government that uh, there's a strong community support for this project and that we're able to meet our obligation financially. So I'll come back to you and we'll make sure that we put contact information for Joe Brandt uh, on the screen for our viewers uh, now that we've got a captive audience. Uh, back to you, uh, Stephen, in just a few um, uh, 
resources? What can you tell people in terms of, you know, if they're having an acute crisis or if they need some help? You mentioned uh, the, the your primary care for physician, family doctor, reach out center for kids. Uh, anything else that that you can direct folks to who may need some assistance? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and again, primary care is is our essential uh, partner um, uh, with all of that. Um, but one of the things that we've done in Burlington, for example, um, is we developed a program uh, called FAST. It's spelled with a PH. Um, uh, it stands for prioritizing, prioritizing health through acute stabilization and transition. And this was a coming together, it's a mouthful, um, but it was a, the, uh, the tagline is when the need is urgent, our response is fast. Uh, this was a coming together of, uh, of the largest mental health and addiction providers in Burlington. Um, so the hospital primary care um, and, uh, and, and several large uh, community agencies to say, how do we make sure in Burlington that when somebody has an urgent need, we all respond uh, quickly together as a team. We provide the care that they need in that uh, moment. Um, and then we make sure that they don't slip through the cracks and that we bring them into whatever other services they need. And this innovative program is actually nationally recognized uh, for uh, uh, a recommendation to be spread across the country. And these are the kinds of made in Burlington um, uh, activities uh, that we're doing uh, in order to respond to people's needs. That's fantastic, uh, and I will. I'm going to try to remember that acronym. But I, I like fast care when you need it. <laughs> That's good. Uh, last word to you, uh, Eric. Where can people uh, donate if they if they want to? Uh, thanks, Mayor Mead Ward. So certainly, people can go to the Joseph Brand Hospital Foundation website to donate directly. Um, there's also a micro website that we've set up specifically to help people learn more about mental health and addiction services and a kind of a quick portal to access uh, almost a directory of where you can get services. So that's uh, located at keepcareclosetohome, all one word, .ca. So keepcareclosetohome.ca. I'd encourage our viewers to go and check out the site. I will do that as soon as we sign off, which is now. Uh, that was a great show. I would really, I really want to thank both of you for joining me, uh, Eric Vanderwall, the president and CEO of Joseph Brandt Hospital, and Dr. Stephen Selchin, the deputy chief of staff, chief of psychiatry, and heads up mental health and addictions at Joseph Brandt Hospital. You've both been uh, terrific in walking us through what mental health and addiction looks like today where to get supports and how people can get involved in this much needed project. So thank you so much for your time today. And uh, for uh, my office, Marianne Mead Ward, uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining another edition of Burlington Matters. <laughs>